Okay, wonderful. I'm going to go ahead and get started today. Um, and I just want to start by saying welcome, and um, we're so glad that you've joined us here for the National Day of Racial Healing for the Oral Health Community. This workshop is provided as part of the National Day of Racial Healing sponsored by the Kellogg Foundation. So we are in alignment with the uh, national movement and we encourage everyone here uh, to join the event later today sponsored by Kellogg Foundation. This workshop is presented jointly by AIDPH, OPEN, WAPHD and APHA Oral Health. And on behalf of all four organizations, thank you so much for being here. First, there are no conflicts of interest. And because this is offered uh, for CEU credits, we wanna make sure everybody had that information. Just a quick bit of housekeeping. Uh, number one, this is meeting format, meaning you can unmute and uh, be on camera, but we are asking during the panel presentation um, that you please keep, keep your video and audio off. As I mentioned, CEUs are available, and at the end of the session, we'll provide a link for the evaluation and CEU request. This panel discussion will be recorded. And we also ask that you provide your personal pronouns to your Zoom name if you're willing and able. You can do that by hovering over your box on Zoom. Um, and to the top right corner, there are three dots that you can press and hit rename and add your personal pronouns. Uh, these are the learning objectives for today. Evaluating systemic influences that both facilitate and impede oral health equity. Analyzing opportunities to apply policy responses to oral health disparities. Explore inroads to racial healing for both personal and professional work within oral health. So we're going to go for about an hour today in this workshop with the first half consisting of a presentation from two panelists. Participants should feel free to use the chat for questions and topics for discussion, recognizing that those will be tackled in the second half with a moderated panel discussion um, and attendees can use the Q&A feature to ask um, panelists directly or use um, the chat to facilitate discussion. And now without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Eleanor Fleming and Dr. Julie Reynolds. Uh, Julie Reynolds is an assistant professor at University of Iowa uh, School of Dentistry and Eleanor Fleming is the assistant dean for diversity and inclusion at University of Maryland. We will put links to their full bios in the chat if you'd like to explore that. Um, and with, with that, I will turn it over to Eleanor and Julie to start their presentation. Thank you. So thank you, Annalise, for that very warm um, introduction. Um, I'm going to be uh, getting us um, started today with the presentation. And on behalf of um, Julie and myself, um, it's truly an, an honor to be here today um, talking about a, a topic that at least between our shared work, um, we've spent a lot of time exploring. So um, we are excited to share um, our thoughts on this very important and timely topic. Um, Annalise um, shared the, the learning and objectives, but just to remind you um, that we um, will be talking about, um, you know, evaluating the systemic influences, analyzing um, opportunities, and e exploring um, inroads um, to uh, racial healing. Um, for Julie and I, we, we come to this work starting at the um, American Association of Public Health Dentistry. And we were able to collaborate in um, two efforts that we want to highlight that I think spark our, our shared being um, for you know, being in this space. Um, first was the um, call to action, anti-racism and dental public health. Um, this white paper offers a, a view of thinking about racial healing, if you will, through anti-racism practices for science, education, policy and practice. And we came to this white paper um, essentially as a, as a what will we do? What will we do as a specialty? And how can we do it in a way that speaks both to the moments that we were living in with the pandemic, um, the murder of George Floyd and how many others during the, the times of this pandemic and also the um, growing anti-Asian hate 
And our response was this white paper, which if you have not um, read it, um, thank you, Francis, for um, putting the, the link in the chat. I, I encourage you to take our specialties um, take on how we can be better and do better. From the white paper, um, Julie and I are the guest co-editors of a special issue of the Journal of Public Health Dentistry that will go deeper into this topic, deeper into thinking about what anti-racism, again, anti-racism um, as a means of racial healing, what can that mean, again, in terms of scientific practice, in terms of clinical practice, looking at policies, advocacies, and educational efforts. So I bring these two resources together in many respects as the background of how Julie and I became the dynamic duo, if you will, um, but also to let you know that we come to this work having spent at least a year on these two projects and in many respects, um, the course of our careers and lives thinking about these issues. So, the, the next slide has an image that is just my personal favorite. And I'm sure that you have seen many different variations of this image, but I, I like to start here because of the, the last bit of this, the justice. So as we think about what these terms are of equality, of equity, and I will leave it to you to read because you are competent readers, so go for it. But what I want to plant the seed for us in terms of our conversation for today is as we think about racial healing and this work of, of actually trying to come together as communities and peoples, again, to do better, what does that mean? What does that mean as equity work? What does that mean as justice work? And as we think about the, the systems that are interrelated with racism, and I will leave it to you to, again, pick your um, du jour for, for today, how can we remove the fences? Remove the fences that keep populations from optimal oral health, remove the fences that keep us from collaborating and being um, inclusive in our day-to-day -day activities wherever you find yourselves. But more importantly, how can we remove the fences in our own relationships? So this is going to be a talk that is in many respects about the practice, the practice that we all do to some degree but also the work that we may need to do on an individual level to be about the work of justice. Now, I offer this next slide as a way to help us in a very nice visual to think about the fences that are at work. And I should tell you that I'm a huge fan of Fisher and Owens. And when I read this in 2007, I was blown away because I was like, this is it. This is the, the best conceptual model of oral, of oral health to date. But as I reflect back on it, I've taken some liberties and um, I hope Fisher and Owens um, and uh, her colleagues won't um, come after me for my um, editorial liberties, but I've added the circle of structural oppression and specifically naming institutionalized racism. And hopefully at this point in our learning, either during the pandemic or prior, you've done the work to understand how racism operates, how racism operates and where people live, what opportunities people have for education, the types of provider types that are available to them. Um, everything from whether you live in a food swamp or whether there is a pick your favorite um, place to buy um, fresh foods is available, you know, to some degree, these practices, these policies, these histories are centered in structural oppression. So I offer this as, again, a conceptual way to think about oral health and to think about oral health and the different ways that racial healing, a coming together, an acknowledgement of these group problems could potentially be addressed and lead to hopefully better outcomes. Now, given that our topic today is looking specifically at policy, I wanted to share in this slide a different type of conceptual model. Um, a conceptual model that helps us to think about, again, health equity, 
that in our shared learning today, we're thinking of in terms of justice. I'm offering that as, a, as something for us to try on as an idea. But thinking about where there are these community solutions. And if you have not read um, this work from the National Academies of Science, Engineering, Medicine, um, I encourage you to, to read the report and especially to think about this idea of community-based solutions. Um, when we ever we think about policy, and please indulge me as I put my political sciences hat on, whenever we think about policy and the policy making process, that work doesn't happen in a vacuum. It doesn't just happen in elected um, areas. So not just in your legislature, not just on your city council, not just at the you know, local health department um, meeting, but it happens everywhere. And these solutions must be, in many respects, community-centered. And it's in centering the communities, again, thinking about the ways that structural inequalities are operating within all of these different segments, where we can think about improving oral health, for example, through transportation. Right, so if there is a, an FQHC or a dental school or some place where people go to receive care and a place where there is functional public transportation, but that place is not on the route for people to get to access care to have a dental home, you know, a policy initiative that might center communities to promote equity, to promote justice, could have a transportation lens. So we've heard this top, this idea, this concept of health and all policies. And this visual to me helps us to think about moving from social determinants of health as defining a problem to going upstream to seeing where we can fix the problem. And finally, this, this leads us to our question. You know, what can we say about oral health through a racial equity, anti-racist, anti-oppression lens? So on the one hand, we know that we have a data problem. And I was hesitant in this occasion of thinking about racial healing to share with you the figures that we've all seen, the figures that define the disparities. And we know what the disparities are. We know what populations bear the burden. So I want to flip it and argue that what we can say about oral health through a racial equity, anti-racist, anti-oppression lens is that we have a data problem. Um, we have a data problem in the need to decolonize the data. And here I want to acknowledge the work of Abigail Echo Hart and others who have been championing to make sure that our data are inclusive. And I give you the snapshot from the North Carolina Health Equity Report of 2018, where American Indians are included in the data outcomes, right? So think about all of those images that you've seen, all of those figures, all of those trend lines, who has been included and who has been excluded. And this notion of racial healing and thinking about oral health through this new lens that Julie and I will offer in this moment of racial healing, one question that comes to mind is thinking about the data. And are we getting data that accurately represent the populations who have the needs? And again, I, I wanna draw your, your attention to the Urban India Health, um, Indian Health Institute. And if you're not familiar with their work, um, I encourage you to learn more about efforts that they're taking to decolonize data. Now, at the end of the day, once we get to our acknowledging our data problem and coming up with our solutions that hopefully center community, we have this choice of choosing equity. Again, choosing health equity as social justice. And I draw your attention to the National Partnership for Women and Families as they have an extensive toolkit for how we can choose health equity and policy policy that is informed by research. And you can see here, it's in everything from defining the question, designing the study, like doing all of the work that those of us who are researchers know how to do, but sharing that information with the decision makers, with the advocates. And I know that there are definitely um, decision makers and advocates in this Zoom space to both understand the problem and to adapt and implement those policy solutions. 
And hopefully, again, the policy solutions are operating on the upstream, like are getting to the root causes. And again, in this moment of, of a racial healing, of thinking about how we can come together in policy efforts, how does that look like in terms of addressing um, systemic oppression? And with that, I will turn it over to Julie, who will help us to apply policy opportunities to advance equity. Julie? Sorry, I lost my mute button there. Good afternoon or morning, everyone, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Julie Reynolds. I had an introduction earlier, but I just want to add to that I am a research fellow at the University of Iowa Public Policy Center. And so I will tackle this second section of this workshop, um, the goal of which is to apply policy opportunities to advance equity. These are the topics that I'm going to cover in this section. These are sort of bread and butter, oral health policy and health policy related topics. Um, including Medicaid and Medicare, but we will examine them with an anti-racism lens today. And then I know that many of us are interested in things that we can do in our professional spaces toward anti-racism. So I will also give a very brief discussion on some organizational policies and actions that we can take in our work life toward anti-racism. And so first I want to center us on why we need to talk about Medicaid in this space. Um, one, it is, many of us know that it's a public insurance program for people who have low income or disability. It is a massive program. It um, insures approximately one fifth of the US population. And thirdly, and most importantly for the discussion today, populations of color are more likely to be enrolled in Medicaid and the anti-racism lens for this is to ask the question, why? And so we need to recognize that the fact that populations of color are overrepresented among Medicaid enrollees is a manifestation of systemic racism. It's the result of past and present racist policies that maintain inequity when it comes to measures of socioeconomic status, like education and employment. And so the fact that we need to focus on Medicaid in a presentation about racial equity means that we have systemic racism and racist policies at work. And remember, to be an anti-racist is to see racial equity, racial inequity as a problem with policy, not with people. So we will examine some policies here that, can, that contribute to racial inequities in oral health, starting with Medicaid. And so the first thing we need to talk about when we talk about Medicaid, before we talk about dental coverage, is Medicaid expansion. And so very briefly, I know many of us are familiar with this, but before the Affordable Care Act, to be eligible for Medicaid, you had to be both low income and what is called categorically eligible, meaning you are a parent, a pregnant person, a child, or an older adult or a person with disability. And so what that meant at the time is that if you were low income and generally childless adult, you were not eligible to enroll in Medicaid. And so what the ACA Medicaid expansion did is extend that umbrella of coverage to all people who were low income, regardless of whether they were in one of these um, previous categor categorical eligibilities. And so as a result of Medicaid expansion, about 15 million people gained coverage um, through the ACA uh, Medicaid expansion policies. You also remember that the Supreme Court ruled that the federal government could not require states to expand their Medicaid programs. And so as a result, we have a number of states that still, as of just this last month, have not adopted Medicaid expansion in their states. There are about 12 states at this time um, that have not done this. And so if you are a person in one of these states and you are low income and not in one of those eligibility categories, you do not have access to, to Medicaid coverage. And so the impact of Medicaid expansion in states that have expanded their programs are 
Um, one, that they have reduced the rate of uninsurance and um, improved access in their Medicaid enrolled populations. And they have also reduced disparities um, in coverage and access as well. So this figure shows both the uninsured rate among adults and the share of adults avoiding medical care due to cost. So you can see a couple of things happening. One is a general reduction in the rate of uninsurance and also a narrowing of that racial disparity too. Uh, much more so in expansion states, there was some reduction in uninsurance in non-expansion states, primarily because of the woodwork effect, people who were previously eligible for Medicaid but might not have realized that they were. Um, but you don't see that same degree of narrowing of the racial disparity in coverage or access in states that did not expand their Medicaid programs. You will also notice that even though racial disparities were reduced, they still persist uh, post Medicaid expansion in states that did uh, choose to expand their Medicaid programs. So there's still work to be done. Hey, Julie, sorry about that. Uh, it's stiff, it's sore, but I can move it and but well, it's please better. Don't so forget to mute yourself if you're not muted. Emergency. I don't know if our hosts can um, mute folks, but thank you. Um, so if we look more closely at the states that did not expand Medicaid, most of them have disproportionately higher populations of color than the states that did expand their Medicaid program. So this figure shows the proportion of the population that is black, and it shows that non-expansion states are more likely to have larger black populations uh, than states that did expand Medicaid. This is shown a different way. This figure shows the racial makeup of the non-expansion states, and it shows that most of them have half or more of their population that are people of color. And so what that means is that Medicaid expansion is anti-racist policy and that the lack of Medicaid expansion in these states is racist policy making because it disproportionately affects populations of color. So now let's talk about public dental coverage. We all know that in our um, public programs, dental coverage erodes as we age, right? So if um, states are required to provide comprehensive dental coverage for children in Medicaid programs, they are not required, states are not required to provide Medicaid coverage for adults in Medicaid programs. And as a result, there is a wide spectrum of coverage across states from comprehensive dental coverage to no coverage at all. And in our National Health Insurance Program for Older Adults, Medicare, there is no dental coverage at all, virtually no dental coverage uh, in the core Medicare program. And so we see this erosion of coverage and essentially the value placed on oral health as we age, which doesn't make sense because good oral health is just as important for a 70 year old as it is for a seven year old. And yet our public benefit dental benefit policies don't reflect that. So this is the current status of uh, Medicaid dental coverage. This is from an ADA Health Policy Institute report. Um, and so you can see that the degree of Medicaid adult dental benefits ranges from extensive in these green states, limited in these blue states. Uh, orange states show the emergency only benefits and the states that are gray have no dental benefits at all. And so there are approximately 12 states that have either emergency only or no dental coverage for adults in Medicaid. And so if we look at the overlap between states that um, expanded their Medicaid programs and states that provide um, greater levels of benefits for Medicaid enrolled adults, um, you can see that there's sort of there's a lot of overlap here, right? So states that did not expand Medicaid are also more likely not to provide dental benefits for adults. And as a result of Medicaid expansion in these blue states, about 10 million adults gained dental coverage through Medicaid expansion. 
And so we can see the combined effect of these two um, different types of policies in this really nice study that came out in Health Affairs last month. It was by some colleagues of mine here at the University of Iowa. They examined the combined effect of Medicaid expansion and the provision of Medicaid adult dental benefits on racial inequities. And so this figure is showing the rates of dental visits. So this is any dental visit, preventive and a treatment visit and disparity, racial disparities in those both before and after the ACA. And this particular figure is showing just the states with extensive dental benefits, which saw a pretty pronounced reduction in that disparity across whether it's any dental visit in the last year, a preventive visit or a treatment visit. And those, the reduction in that disparity was not evident in states with limited dental benefits or no dental benefits at all. And I do also wanna point out the scale here. So even though there was a reduction in the disparity, this is still only less than 30% of low-income adults who received a dental visit in the last year. And so that even though um, it's something to be celebrated that racial disparities were reduced, they still exist, they were not eliminated, and the utilization levels are still extremely low for uh, low-income adults in this age group. And so the take-home messages for Medicaid adult dental policy is that providing extensive Medicaid adult dental benefits is anti-racist oral health policy. And also, um, we know based on the persistent racial disparities that we can see, despite the progress toward racial equity and coverage and access, disparities still persist, even in expansion states that have extensive adult dental coverage. Um, so there are a lot of other factors, of course, besides just providing coverage that impact the ability to access dental care and ultimately uh, oral health outcomes. A much more mundane topic than coverage, but still very important is the ability to measure racial equity. And so if we want to hold state Medicaid programs and other organizations accountable for racial equity, they need to be able to measure that. And so I would like to just share this really nice resource from Families USA to help give some ideas about advocacy opportunities, uh, in particular in this case for um, state Medicaid programs to be able to measure and improve the quality of care and reduce disparities. And so I'll just highlight a couple of examples here. Um, one advocacy opportunity is to comment on proposed Medicaid managed care contracts. So many of our state dental, state Medicaid programs, including dental coverage, are administered by uh, managed care companies or private, uh, private benefit plans. And so, there are often opportunities to make public comment about the uh, making sure that those contracts address data collection and performance improvement projects on equity. Uh, similarly, in states that utilize Section 1115 waivers, for example, if they're undergoing uh, demonstration projects for their Medicaid programs, there are definitely public comment periods and the opportunity to uh, try to ensure that those uh, waiver proposals include measure quality measurement plans that address equity. So those would be a couple of examples um, at the state Medicaid program level. Um, we can try to seek legislation that measures disparities for the payers in our state, both private and, um, and public. We can also get involved in national efforts to improve the quality measurement tools um, that govern the, the uh, measurement and improvement in care quality for our public benefit, dental benefit plans. And so now I'll just transition briefly to Medicare. We all know that Medicare is a national health insurance program for older Americans and um, Medicare, the core Medicare program does not include dental coverage, virtually none at all. Yet, um, some people do still have access to dental coverage, either through a Medicare Advantage plan, through being duly eligible or duly enrolled in both Medicaid and Medicare, 
uh, through a private plan that they might have with their employer. And then we see this almost half or about 24 million people that do not have any dental coverage at all. And if we look at um, utilization of dental care, so the, the previous figure was coverage, uh, this is dental utilization, and we can see that there are racial disparities in the proportion of people who do not visit the dentist in the past year. And this is among all Medicare beneficiaries, but if we look here at just the traditional Medicare beneficiaries, so this excludes people with Medicare Advantage because most Medicare Advantage plans do have some degree of dental benefits. Um, but if we look here at just traditional Medicare beneficiaries, there are much more pronounced disparities with respect to receiving dental care than there are with, in this case, a physician visit. Um, and so, you know, this is pointing us to a um, to the knowledge that providing Medicare dental coverage is anti-racist policy because it is likely to reduce these disparities. Um, to bring us closer to, to what we have here, which is still a disparity, but it's a lot less than what we see for dental visits. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that, of course, um, improvements in dental coverage are important and necessary, but of course not sufficient toward racial equity and oral health. And so we really need uh, movement on other aspects of our oral health care system, including improvement in workforce racial diversity, uh, delivery system innovations that extend the reach of dental clinics out into communities, and also workforce models that improve community trust and access. And outside of our oral healthcare system, we have to advocate for anti-racist policies that impact the social determinants of oral health, like education, policy, employment, housing, and transportation. Here are some advocacy resources, um, a number of toolkits from CareQuest, Open and Families USA, and a really nice report from the ADA Health Policy Institute um, for your, your use after this uh, workshop. And then I will just um, give a very brief and incomplete discussion on organizational opportunities for anti-racist action, uh, mainly as food for thought, because I know a lot of us are eager to think about the work that we can do within our professional organizations um, toward anti-racism. So there are so many types of organizations within our oral health sphere, right? From payers to different sizes of practices, from academic institutions to oral health coalitions. And no matter what type of space we're operating in professionally, there are opportunities to take anti-racist action. And a lot of these example strategies um, I draw from a really nice article, um, a scoping review that was published last year. So do check out this article. Um, but one of the take home messages of the article is that we need um, change in organizational policies that reflect both individual level racism and organizational level racism. And so a couple of strategies at the individual level would include things like providing ongoing training that includes concepts related to racism and unconscious bias to raise knowledge and awareness about these concepts. Um, you know, we talk about the importance of this for dentists, but equally as important are um, raising knowledge and awareness about unconscious bias and racism among other staff members, uh, including dental assistants, dental hygienists, front desk staff people. Um, because they are often, if we're talking about, you know, clinical care delivery, they are often the people that are talking the most with patients, right? And so it's just as important for uh, people at multiple, in multiple roles uh, within a healthcare delivery system to be aware of these issues. Um, another individual level mechanism or strategy is to institute patient or staff reporting mechanisms for discrimination and also to follow up on them. Um, so, you know, if there's a particular provider in an organization that is engaging in discriminatory behavior, their supervisors need to know about that and need to follow up on it to try to help that person 
be aware and discontinue the behavior. Remember that most discrimination, most individual level racism is in the form of unconscious bias. Uh, so people who are engaging in that behavior most likely don't realize that they're doing it or saying something offensive. And so it's important to raise awareness and try to support that person to, uh, to change behavior. Um, some organizational level uh, strategies for anti-racism are to ensure that uh, organizational leadership articulates anti-racism as an institutional priority. Um, they could develop a leadership committee that's charged with implementing action plans toward anti-racist goal goals. They could infuse anti-racism education uh, in things like newsletters or new provider orientation. They could collect data to identify racial disparities and their sources within their organization. Again, measurement is so important to be able to demonstrate improvement and progress. And then also incorporating anti-racism into quality improvement activities. And so with that, I will turn it back to Eleanor. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Um, I got caught up in the, the chat and just want to share something that is alive at the moment. Um, this idea of anti-racist and equity enhancing policies, like what does that really look like when we take a step or two back to look at the systems, to look at the structures? And I think what Julie has done very um, skillfully is help us to think about Medicaid expansion, dental benefits and Medicare, like these large structural policies, public insurance, and how using an anti-racist equity enhancing lens, what work can be done as we, you know, think about what this slide is suggesting, inroads to racial healing. So as we, as we consider what this means for us in terms of personal and professional work, you know, I invite us all to think about how you can bring an equity lens to your work. Now, I won't begin to um, list all of the various roles, all of the activities that we have um, on our individual and collective plates, but I can guarantee you at a minimum, if you look in a room if you look at whoever is in the, the Zoom, Teams, WebEx, whatever you're using at this moment for virtual meetings or in person, and if you notice that there are people who are missing, how can you use your power, your privilege to invite individuals to the space? You know, who are the partners who you work with? Right, we all have our list of, of usual suspects. I would, I would say right now in this space that AIDPH, AAPHD, Open, the American Public Health Association, Oral Health Section, like these are CareQuest Institute, like these are some of the big players in this space. But what would it look like if, I don't know, an invitation was sent to the Society of American Indian Dentists? to the National Dental Association, to the Hispanic Dental Association. And I'm, and I'm picking those a bit at random, but on purpose, but how can we reimagine who our partners could be and who could lend some voice that is missing at the table? There's also this idea on the next slide of how are we sharing power? Right, we, we can't think about this work of policy advocacy, policy development, any of these work without saying that at, at the basis is power. There is a power dynamic that some people have and some people do not have. But are we willing to share power? Are we willing to share power to be an ally to others, with others? Are we willing to share power, meaning that sometimes you may need to sit down and be quiet so that someone else's voice and perspective could be elevated? The big one for me is how are we creating opportunities for others, right? This idea of racial healing, of anti-racist practice, of creating better policies, better organizations, better institutions, better dental homes, in many respects is about creating opportunities. 
So when, where, and how can you do that? Now, this is a this is a biggie for me. And again, I, I kind of I kind of played my cards up front. But in our work, are we just perpetuating disparities? And I raise my hand as someone who is who feels guilt about doing this, like very real guilt about telling you about disparities, but never getting to the root causes. So how in our work can we go beyond the prevalence of X among this group is Y percent compared to this group to actually getting to those root causes? And maybe the root cause, if you happen to be in a state that has not gotten around to expanding Medicaid, maybe that is your work. Maybe your work is um, ensuring that um, school-based dental sealant programs, um, when they will be functioning at this time after the pandemic, that they're getting to all of those children and adults who need it. Maybe that work is getting to root causes around access to healthy foods, to sugar-sweetened beverages, whatever your issue is, how can you do that root cause work versus just solving a problem? And finally, we all have our privileges. How are we using them wisely, right? Are you in spaces where things are said about particular types of, of patients where you are quiet because you don't wanna rock the boat? Are you in a state where there are clearly anti-equity policies that are being promoted and you say or do nothing? How might we wisely use privilege as a part of doing this very important work? As many of you will know, um, the, the thinker, the scholar, the intellectual giant Bell Hooks left this planet a few weeks ago. And I found this image, um, which is the next slide, that to me spoke to what we we're doing. Now, if you've read anything about Bell Hooks, you know that she is a, a Black anti-oppression scholar. Some would call her feminist, but I feel like that's just too small of a box for her. And her work um, in many of her pieces focuses on this idea of love and healing in a very real sense. So not in the sense that you may love your partner or may love your pet or, or love whomever, however you love, but this idea of that um, agape love, if we think about um, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and kind of social movements around civil rights. And this idea that rarely, if ever, are any of us healed in isolation. Healing is an act of communion. Healing is an act of communion. As much great work as Julie and I continue to do together, as I know those of you in this Zoom space are doing wherever you are in the country, in the world, however you are engaging with patients, communities, and decision makers, we must do it as a collective. And hopefully in our efforts, we will make real this call to action that the late Bell Hooks is telling us to heal as an act of communion. Um, Julie and I would be remiss as professors if we didn't give you some, some reading assignments. So the next, the next slide has your um, additional readings if you want to expand your um, knowledge base. Um, but I do hope that we have offered something in our time together um, that will help us to take those steps and to continue to make, take those steps towards racial healing. And with that, we say thank you. And I will take a look to see what is alive in the chat in terms of questions. So thank you. Or if I could jump in, there was a question on the most recent piece of the chat, um, and it was it was from Tara. And if Tara, if you would like to unmute, you can. Or if not, I can repeat your question in the chat. But feel free to unmute if you'd like to ask it live. Okay, Tara cannot unmute. 
Uh, so Tara asks, does anyone know of any organizations or resources that are specifically targeted for advocates in very conservative environments? The level of opposition to even the tiniest amount of progress is an incredible obstacle. Where do we start with so much hostility? No, Tara, I think that that is a very fair question as someone who um, had to leave home <laughs> because um, my ideas made me dangerous, right? My, my, my ideas were very threatening to the status quo. Um, and what I found in the home of Moms for Liberty is that um, there were community members who were organizing in a very conservative environment. So I encourage you to start where you are and to see who is doing the work. And maybe it's a group that you plug into in social media, but know that there is, in many respects, safety in numbers, unless you're like me and you're like, peace out, I will just take my progressive ideas um, someplace else. Um, another group where I'm not sure if you have um, connected with, and I'm, I'm gonna box it, but um, Google and look at the work of uh, Reverend uh, Dr. Barber and the Poor People's Campaign. And I bring this up because it is a group that works in very politically conservative environments around anti-poverty. And they have a lot of resources in terms of how you organize, um, language that you use. And it's also important to note, again, that some of these things just may not be possible. I think it was Paula who raised the question in the chat of, you know, what do we do um, in states where, you know, um, everyone is flocking to the South due to low tax rates? How are these states expected to pay for benefits without raising taxes, right? Like that becomes a concrete effort to organize around you know, in having a state income tax or how budgets are being distributed. But at the end of the day, you know, know that you are, are not alone and be skilled again in how you use your privilege, how you used your power, and that there is also some safety in numbers. So find those like-minded people in, you know, politically conservative spaces who have ideas that you want to rally around. And then lastly, like, you got to be in it, like, you got to get in the game. So maybe you run for school board. Maybe you run for, you know, an appointment to the public health board. Like, you have to be out there. You, you, you have to be in the, the arena. Oh, Helene also referenced the Southern Poverty Resource Center, which is another um, another great one. Um, National Rural Health Association, thanks Effie for bringing that up, and another great place. And then Eleanor, I'm not sure if you saw the comment on focusing on decolonizing data. Uh, so Tuka mentioned that that was a, a really clear an, uh, example and asked if there are any resources about how to take action on decolonizing data or steps that we can take in doing that work. Um, great question, Tuka. And the Urban, Indi Urban Indian um, Health Institute is a great place to start. Like I said, Abigail Echohart has been leading this effort for a long time. Um, I should also mention that you know some of this work in decolonizing data starts within states. Um, so one of the things that North Carolina has done during the pandemic is making sure that their COVID data were broken down in categories of people so that they could better see the inequities. So I think one, one step you can take is going to your state health department, seeing how data are presented. And if you know that there are people who are not being represented in the counts, asking that question. So asking the question to your um, state office of minority health, asking that question to your um, state epidemiologist, like why aren't the data, why are data black and white? 
Why, why are we only seeing black and white numbers when we live in a state where we know that there are other people who need to be considered? Now, the thing to keep in mind is that some of those data may not be able to be reported because of small numbers of people, but that doesn't, but that doesn't mean that the data cannot be aggregated. So it, it takes one, um, again, taking a look at how your data are reported and then using your, your power, your privilege as a you know, resident to ask the question. So th I think those are two, two steps that you can, can take to hopefully get better data where you are. And I would just add too that the same goes within your workplace. You know, if you are in a DSO, you should be asking, you know, what are our what are our measures of patient satisfaction disaggregated by race and ethnicity? And if we see a difference, then what is the what's the cause of that, and how can we provide opportunities for growth among our providers? So you know, stratifying the, those outcomes by race and ethnicity is really a first step to uncover disparities at all levels, whether it's in a state Medicaid program or in an academic dental, dental institution um, or in a private practice. And one thing that I'll add to this, um, Julie, and you make a very great point um, in thinking about, you know, in clinical practice is we have to ask the question, Right, so on your patient intake question, if you're not asking people how they identify, and again, we are living in 2022 and we know that there are multiple ways that people can identify. And while we usually think of it as being about this, we know that it can be about a lot of other things. So if you're not collecting the data in the beginning, to ask people how they identify, you will never be able to get the report at the end where you disaggregate the data to say that X group of people are experiencing this compared to Y. So go back to your, and this could be a, a nice exercise for you to do in your institution. Maybe you go to HR if you're in a big situ, a, a bigger organization. Maybe you go to you know the person who manages you know patient affairs to see how, what data are we getting, and is it the data that we actually need, and how might we implement changes in our processes to ask the question. And then I think with the few minutes we have left, I'd like to take a little bit of pulpit privilege to ask if you could provide us with one action item. Let's say we ignored everything and this was the one take home thing that we had um, as a closeout to this event. What would be the action items that each of you would recommend to us? I can start with starting with yourself and your own knowledge and awareness about anti-racism and unconscious bias. Um, so you feel empowered to bring that topic to your organizations and to your friends and loved ones and professional networks. Um, you know, enhance your own knowledge and awareness space first so that you can then spread that. I'm going to give you two only because I feel like I'm upping the ante and I think that this group is ready for it. So the first one is notice the spaces where you're in, who is there and who is not there, and consider who you can invite to be at the table. And the second one is if you are a member of a dominant group, however we are defining dominant these days, consider a membership and a group of someone that is potentially historically marginalized. Now that's going, that, that's going to cost you some money because you're actually going to have to pay for a membership. But consider what it would be like to bring your folding chair to their table. Right, and just to listen and learn. And I'm not saying that you have to do anything other than your presence, 
I hope that you'll do what Julie is suggesting in terms of learning, but what would that look like for you? And you can, you can pick the group, right? You, I'm, I'm not necessarily saying that everyone needs to join SED or that everyone needs to join the NAACP or again, whatever the organization is, but consider taking your dollars and your curiosity to be a member. Pay attention to what you learn and hopefully in that learning, you can find practices that can be done wherever you are, in the classroom, at the hiring table, in your clinic, in your professional organization. So yeah, that I will, I'm, I'm gonna give you two, two things um, as action steps. Wonderful. I certainly appreciate those action items and hope that I can accomplish those myself. Um, and also, I want to say thank you again so much to Dr. Julie Reynolds and Dr. Eleanor Fleming for this presentation, for their words, their wisdom, their resources, and time and energy and efforts. Um, so we will record this. We have been recording it. We will make it publicly available. If you would like CE credit for the event, there is a link in the chat. Otherwise, I would encourage anyone who would like to, to interact with um, Dr. Reynolds and Dr. Fleming uh, individually. I'm sure they'll provide that opportunity. Um, and if so, you can put, put yourself in contact with us at AIDPH and we're happy to sh share out their emails individually for anybody who has follow-up.